All right, so we're going to hear from sort of a guest lecturer today. Uh, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. So you can take it away. Hey, um, good morning, everyone. <laughs> so today uh, I'm going to give you a presentation on a brief review of automatic information extraction from material science literature. My name is uh, Jian Wu. I'm um, assistant professor of computer science at Old Dominion University. So uh, first I want to give me a brief introduction. Uh, many people uh, may not know me. So I, I got my PhD um, in 2011 in astronomy and astrophysics. And my advisors were Dr. Don Schneider and Dr. Jen Chowton. Um, I, I believe um, Don is the department chair of astronomy now and Jen is still a, a professor. So um, my PhD work was on, on quasars um, and uh, cosmology. So I used lots of data from Sloan Digital Sky Survey and Hubble Space Telescope to study the, uh, the physical properties of quasars. Um, and then in, in 2011, I, I changed my interest and start working with uh, uh, Dr. Lee Jowles on the information science and technology and became the tech leader of the Sightseer X project. As you may know, Sightseer is the digital library search engine um, hosting uh, millions of academic documents. And in 2017, I was promoted as assistant teaching professor. And then in 2018, I joined the um, Old Dominion University as a, a tenure track um, assistant professor. So my research interest includes text mining, scholarly big data, applied machine learning and deep learning, natural language processing and information retrieval. Um, I have um, several um, projects, so I just uh, select a few ones. Um, first is called SiteCRX, as you uh, know. Um, SiteCRX is the digital library search engine <laughs> that has been running for more than 20 years. Our goal is to develop a sustainable architecture to support a scholarly big data. So this is a project supported by NSF, collaborative with Penn State. Another is called ETD project, in which we um, um, get support from um, the Institutes of Museum and the Library Services. Our goal is to mine electronic thesis and dissertations. Uh, we have a lot of interesting works like uh, summarization, classification, and segmentation. Um, this is collaborated with Virginia Tech. Um, the third is reproducibility projects, uh, which we uh, focus on extracting um, uh, claim level features from research papers in social and behavioral sciences. And this is a, a project supported by DARPA, um, still collaborated with Penn State. And uh, next is scientific figures. Uh, we're studying topological relation based image analysis. And this is a project supported by, by DOE and collaborated with um, Los Alamos National Lab. And the next is fake scientific new detection. And so this is a, a project that uh, does I collaborate with Dr. Jiang Li at ECE department at ODU and Dr. Jeremiah Steele uh, in psychology at ODU. So uh, now let's get back to the material science domain. So the motivation is like this. We have a lot of material properties reported in research papers published in research venues, right? So typically, um, this in peer-reviewed journals. Um, um, and um, manually compiling data, although it's accurate, is laborious and it may take a tremendous amount of time. So two of the uh, examples are um, Gualtier's et al. 2013 and, uh, and, and Gag Beggy et al. 2015. So, I've, so I'm going to give you a more uh, detailed in, introduction in the next slide. So, it's, so, so manually compiling data is already laborious and maintaining such a database and keep it up to date is even more laborious and it requires dedicated monitoring of new papers which uh, is um, tedious and uh, slow. So how can we leverage AI machine learning and deep learning to automate and uh, accelerate building such a database which must less human effort? 
is a research question. So these are the two papers I mentioned um, that have been done by um, researchers from UCSB and Harvard. Um, so Gaudiers as all, well, uh, they focus on thermoelectric materials. Uh, they included 100 publications and then they manually uh, curated uh, 18,000 data points. Uh, most of them are relevant to properties measured at several temperatures, and also they measured uh, something called HH, HHI. Um, it's actually calculated. So the next step was done by a, a research group from University of Utah and also UCSB, in which they studied 200 publications and the focus on the lithium ion battery electrode materials. They manually extracted uh, 16,000 data points, including key parameters and variables of batteries. Um, and um, you know, the parameters include the, uh, the crystal abundance and the HHSI. So this slide shows the workflow uh, in Gold Tours at all 2013. Um, so you can see that they start with literatures and then uh, they manually extract the data and the metadata and put them in a database, so or a spreadsheet or whatever. And then they just build a website and uh, let user choose all the parameters and then realize it, right? So this is the, um, the website and this website is still up and running. Uh, if you're interested, you can get there. So we will see um, a, a diagram like this. That they will allow you to pick up the X and Y parameters and the marker size parameters um, and then uh, make the plot. So the plot will be generated instantly. So you can see that uh, if you hop your um, mouse on each of the data points, you will see that each data points actually give you some information of the, the composition of the materials and uh, um, the source. So I, I, I just found the source by looking at DOIs um, and then it's, it, it's read that from that paper. So uh, there have been a, a decent amount of work on automatic information extraction from chemistry or material science literature. So I, I just leave them here. The, the earliest one I could have find was dated back to 1993. And um, um, earlier this year, I attended a, a, a workshop on semantic document understanding. And this uh, young at all, they studied the name entity re recognition from material science papers. So in this short uh, presentation, I'm not going to review all of them, but I'm going to focus on the one uh, in red. Uh, that includes Kim et al. 2017 A and B. These two projects are done by, uh, by people uh, from uh, MIT and UMass. They actually, um, so these two papers are very similar. Um, and uh, the next one is Weston et al. 2019. So this is a paper um, uh, done by um, the UC Berkeley and it, uh, the MISO at 2020 uh, is, is basically um, the uh, ground truth uh, data sets uh, done by um, the MIT and UMass group. So the three papers basically um, uh, strongly associated. And uh, the, the Kuniyoshi paper is a recent paper, but they, they focus on something different. So I want to include it. So, so first, uh, I want to start with Kim's paper, 2017 A and B. The general goal is to extract and, uh, and data mining um, and materials synthesis procedures and conditions. So this is the, the general pipeline. They start with the, a bunch of keywords selected by material scientists. And then they just search the Crossref API to obtain the DOIs. And then from the publishers, they download the data. Uh, what well, the data means mean the PDFs. And then they extract the text from PDFs in which we call text conversion. And then not all the texts are relevant to material synthesis. So they uh, must do some classification. And then come from the most interesting part is parsing and extraction, which um, it needs to, to leverage computer scientists to build the model and the material scientists uh, to contribute the domain expert. And when they get all the uh, information parsed and extract, they can do uh, data mining. So let's me first uh, uh, you know, 
talk about the text conversion and the classification. So there are many off-shelf tools to convert PDF to text, uh, such as PDF to text, XPDF, Growbit, et cetera, although the quality may vary. Um, so, so this is relatively straightforward. Uh, the text classification is a little bit um, complicated uh, because um, you know, there are paragraphs uh, level, there are section level, and a lot of the text are not related to a material synthesis. So they need to classify text into two types. One is, par is paragraphs about material synthesis, and another is paragraphs not about material synthesis. So this is a supervised learning. So they have to build the ground truth. Um, they uh, just manually labeled uh, paragraphs from 100 journal articles and use this as the training set. And then they build a representation of the text using back of words and word embedding. So I'm going to explain what they mean. And they use the, the linear classifier called logistic regression and they get performance of 95%. So it's very, um, uh, it's kind of accurate. So um, text representation is a very uh, broad topic. And I can spend the whole, whole semester on that. Uh, but here, I just want to do a one slide introduction. So the most uh, widely used uh, text representations is uh, called a bag of word and a word embedding. So what does text representation mean? So let's say I gave two paragraphs, right? A and B, how do we compare these two paragraphs are similar to each other? Right. So one intuitive way is to look at the, the words, right? If um, <clears throat> um, the, so, so if uh, these two paragraphs have um, many overlapping words and uh, also the word frequencies in these two uh, paragraphs are similar, then I can uh, conclude that these two paragraphs are similar, okay? Of course, this is not 100% accurate, but it's, it's something that we can work on. So this is the idea of, of backend words. So basically to compare this two, uh, two, two documents, Mary is hungry for apples and John is happy, he is not hungry for apples. We need to um, first account all the unique words in these two, two documents. And then for each document, we just count the number of occurrences of each word. And so in this case, uh, uh, Mary occurs once, and is of course once, and hungry of course once, and uh, an apple of course once, and all the others ha has zero. And uh, for a second document, and uh, is of course twice, right? And uh, memory um, of course uh, zero times, and all the others of course uh, one time. So from this, we can generate a vector, which is used to represent this text, right? And then we can calculate the cosine similarities between these two vectors and use that as a mirror of the similarities between this document. That's the idea of backer word. So the second is, uh, so backer word is called a local representation. The dimension of the, um, the vector um, e equals the size of the vocabulary. So for these two documents, they're relatively simple. So the dimension is really low. However, if you want to represent a general text, and the, uh, the vocabulary is basically the number of words in English, right? So the, the, the dimension could be as high as 200,000 to even 500,000. So it's an extremely large uh, vector, but this is also extremely sparse vector. So um, then people uh, had, uh, so recently people have training something called word embedding, uh, which is called a distributed uh, representation. So for each word, um, they use a vector to represent it. For example, the king, queen, uh, woman, and a princess, right? Uh, so instead of looking at the occurrences, they look at the aspect, let's say a royalty, right? So king has a very high royalty, so 0 0.99, and the, and the queen has a relatively high royalty, 0 0.99, but woman, and a but woman has relatively low, so 0 0.02. And we look at the uh, masculinity, um, the king is really high, but queen is really low, so 0 0.05. And the femininity, uh, the, the, king has, the king has 0 0.05, so it, it's really low, and the queen is very high, so 0 0.93. So um, 
After this, I mean, each word can be represented by a vector, right? And this, uh, and each word can be, I mean, can be, they actually um, uh, take a place in the, um, the feature space, right? And this feature, uh, the dimension of the features depending on like how many aspects you're looking at. And then from the words, uh, we can uh, aggregate them and generate the, the representation of the whole, whole document. Right, so that's the idea of, of word embedding. So the results of the word embedding is that it's a bunch of um, vectors of dimension about uh, 100 to 500. So much lower than the, the back word uh, uh, model, uh, but it's really dense, it's really dense. And those uh, vector has a characteristic is that semantically similar words they will occupy, uh, they will be um, closer in each other in, the, in their uh, feature space. So that's the uh, really uh, uh, good uh, characteristic of word embedding. Okay, so the word embedding has to be, um, has to be trained. So you have to have the embedder trained. So, so given a word, it can output uh, a vector. So there have been many, many <laughs> word embedding models trained. One is called context, independent, another is context uh, dependent. So word to vec Glove, and FAST, they are early um, context independent, which means that each word has a unique, um, uh, has a fixed uh, vector uh, representation, like Apple, right? It has a vector and it it's always has that vector, uh, regardless of where it appears. The context dependent means that um, the representation of the word depends on the actual context, like the Apple, company and uh, like um, eat an apple, right? So these two will have uh, different uh, vectors. So um, some examples like Elmo, which are developed by Alan AI and a bird uh, by Google. So this is one of the most uh, 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 popular uh, uh, used and uh, Roberta and this tube bird and tiny bird and sign bird and bio bird. So, th so these are all, um, you know, uh, generated from bird. So why do people, I mean, do all, so many uh, word embedding? So I'm gonna show you uh, in one of the examples uh, later. It's because sometimes people need the, vo the vocabularies to cover all the, um, the vocabularies in a, uh, a set of documents. If the vocabulary is not large enough, there will be a lot of out of, of vocabulary words, and those words will be represented by the default vectors um, and which will dramatically uh, uh, decrease the performance of the language model. So on the right hand side is just the TSE plot of the, of the Wikipedia vocabulary. Uh, so you can see that semantically similar words, they occupy, uh, you know, they are closer in the feature space. So, um, now let's back to the paper, um, uh, Kim's paper. So how do they extract the uh, name entities? Uh, they use um, uh, the way that um, it depends on the dependency parsing. So the dependency parsing is, uh, is a very commonly used operation in, in natural language processing. So basically they will um, first attack each word with the part of speech. So which is noun and which is adjective and something like that. And also they will study the dependencies of each word. And let's say if, um, say in this case, the, um, so the is used of, uh, for modifying the properties. So although, I mean, they have, uh, you know, their distance is a bit longer, but the is um, used to determine uh, the property. So, so you can see that this complicated, um, dependencies will help us to find out um, the um, associations between certain words and tokens. And, uh, and you can also see that, uh, you know, this whole sentence is breaking into tokens and each token can be a word, it can be a symbol, and it can be a punctuation mark. And even the, uh, the, um, the composition expressions, they are, um, disintegrated into uh, 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 things like that. So using this uh, dependency um, 
parsing results, the compositions like the uh, this one can be extracted from the parsing results. However, uh, it has disadvantages. The first is that this method depends on the quality of the dependency parser. So if the dependency parser is not good enough, um, then uh, you'll have errors. And the second, it does not classify uh, the types of phrases parsed. So it does not tell you like uh, which one is a uh, 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 material and which one is the property. So because of that, they have to uh, do, do something else. So the left-hand side is a non-phrases parsed from the dependency parser. And then they are going to match uh, with um, the, the PubCam uh, data set. They also uh, use the CAM uh, data extractor um, and trying to extract it. And then they also build a simple n-gram classifier. And then they just match what they extracted with uh, uh, the result in the database and uh, see if they find a, 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 any match. So basically they're looking for the consistencies. Inconsistency uh, phrases will be dropped. And then uh, they, they build a neural network classifier to classify these phrases into different types, well, material operation amounts, conditions. So this neural network classifier is trained on a human annotated uh, data consisting of 500 words. So you can see that uh, there are a lot of uh, humans effort out here. So an alternative approach, which was um, actually published in another paper, uh, it came out to the summit B, is that, okay, I'm, I'm trying, to, so I'm trying to predict the type for each word in a sentence. For example, in this sentence, the nanostructured Titania was prepared by. So they are trying to predict the, the type of Titania. So how do we predict the type? They need to do, build a classifier, right? And how do you, you classify this? You need to build a presentation. So the representation of this word has two components. One is the, the regular word embedding, right? So here they do not use the pre-trained word embedding. Uh, such as the one that I showed above, right? Instead, they train their own um, word embedding using uh, 640,000 articles. The reason is because this is um, this word embedding will contain will most likely contain a very large percentage of of tokens that's covered in the data sets they are going to classify, right? So, and then. Besides word embedding, they also use some, some binary heuristic. For example, um, is whether Titania appears uh, in a database uh, or in a catalog of materials and something like that. So, and then they just concatenate these two vectors into a dense real value and fixed length vector out here. And they just use a soft mass as output. And then finally, they I mean the soft max is just a, you know, a function which can map um, anything um, to um, to between uh, zero and one, right? So it's basically a probability, and then if it's high probability into materials, it's just classify it as materials. This whole process is called sequence tagging, and then after sequence tagging, they are going to do chunking. The chunking means that okay, I have I and uh, oxide classified as, as materials, and these two are next to each other. So I just glue them together and generate the iron oxide, and this is classified as material. Um, and then, based on the grammatical, uh, uh, the grammatical dependencies, they can uh, infer the um, the relationships between materials and operations. So. Uh, this table just uh, uh, lists the word categories and labels. So we can see that material is one of them, but they also have operation and target and specified or something like that. So I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I'm just showing that uh, this is what they did. So the machine learning is not 100%, right? So in order to really uh, generate useful data, we do need uh, human uh, verification. So they do uh, two types of verification. Uh, one is automatic. They basically um, uh, uh, generate another uh, independent dual labeled uh, data set of 30 articles, uh, which is used to confirm the consistency of the annotation and also provide a baseline for the upper bounds of expected performance. 
right? So machines cannot ex um, exceed the performance of humans, right? The humans uh, does not agree on, uh, uh, does not um, uh, agree on something like that, then you don't know uh, whether the machines can do it uh, correctly or not. And then using the data, you can do all sorts of data mining. So this is uh, just a slide showing the selected results from Kim 2017A. Uh, so this two, uh, two diagram shows the, the synthesis parameter distribution of oxide systems. The left one is the, the violin histogram Gaussian kernel density estimate distributions of um, calcination temperatures for various oxide. You can see that this is uh, for binaries, this is uh, ternaries, um, and, and quaternaries, um, and this is the uh, uh, pantanaries. And also they, this, um, uh, they gives um, some examples for each category. Um, the right side is the 2D um, has gone only been the normalized his crimes for uh, hydrothermal reaction and calcination times and temperatures for binary oxide. So, I think I will uh, defer this to um, material scientists for interpretation. But what I want to point it out, so look at these numbers, right? So these are automatically extracted. Um, so it will take a lot of time to manually curate this uh, data for humans. So this is uh, 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 the result displayed in Kim et al. 2017b, which uh, shows the um, Temperature and time distribution of titanium uh, extracted from um, 17,000 uh, articles discussing the synthesis. So you can uh, clearly see the trend. And again, uh, uh, this will take a long time for humans to extract those data. And uh, this paper also um, uh, publicized their code and data. So next I want to talk about another paper called Annotating and Extracting Synthesis Process of All Solid State Batteries from Scientific Literature, uh, written by uh, Kuniyoshi at uh, 2020. Um, so the main contribution of this paper is to build a ground truth corpus on synthesis processes of ASSBs based on 243 papers. Also they propose um, automatic synthesis process extraction framework that combines deep planning and a root-based re, um, re, uh, relation extractor. So I want to talk about this uh, is, uh, is because uh, this paper has, um, has a, a comparison of performance on the choice of, uh, of language model for the previous one, they just say, okay, we use a preprint model. And also this paper has more careful evaluation. So, the goal of this paper is to um, extract a, something called a synthesis graph. So given a paragraph like this, which describes the material synthesis processes, um, this, the, the framework will, will generate a graph representation. Well, the graph contains uh, nodes and edges, right? So the, the red nodes represent materials and the green nodes represent operations and the yellow means property. And also they have arrows uh, to connect these um, uh, nodes, like the arrows means um, um, uh, next, and um, this um, the gray uh, dotted lines is condition, um, and uh, the, the red uh, dotted lines are co-reference. So co-reference means that these two are basically the same thing. So, this paper, they focus on uh, three types of entities, uh, materials, operation, and property. And uh, materials has uh, several types, like materials start, materials intermediate, materials final, material solvents, materials others. And they only have one type of operation. So operation is operation, like a bomb yield. And they have um, six types of properties, the property time, um, temperature, rotation, pressure, atmosphere, and others. Right? And also I, I give you some examples um, for you to, to better understand. So um, first they, they do the, uh, the annotation. The whole pipeline is very similar to the one I showed above. Um, so they start a bunch of keywords and from search engines, they 
uh, search papers and uh, to download the PDF from publishers. But this time they select uh, certain sections like experimental um, preparation and methods because they believe these sections will be um, uh, mostly useful for describing the procedures. And then they extract the text from the sections and then they do some manual correction. Uh, make sure that uh, the text, uh, you know, there, because the, the text conversions are not perfect. Sometimes uh, if uh, the text was justified, there might be a hyphen at the end of um, a line, right? And when you convert it into text, those hyphens will not be automatically removed. So you have to manually remove that. And sometimes you will have um, the line breaks and uh, there will be like a, a footer between two pages and the footer will just uh, appear uh, you know, uh, in the middle of um, this uh, two sec, uh, two parts of a, a paragraph. So, so the footer needs to be removed. So, I mean, the paragraph will be continuous, right? So, and after that, this um, paper leverage three um, domain expert to do the annotation, and uh, of course, these are material scientists. And then they have one um, person to, to do the verification and make uh, to you know make sure that they don't uh, goofy the you know the annotation. And then they uh, um, had a, a two hundred and forty three uh, documents. So this is the the statistics of the annotation result. You can see that this is the total number of materials, and this is a breakdown of materials. And this is the breakdown of properties. And also uh, these are relationships. So, um, so you can see that these numbers are generally big. So you have uh, at least uh, you know, several hundred for the materials and uh, for operations, and you have like over 1000. And this, so this is, this is very good. But also I want to, to, <laughs> to look at this too. One is material intermediate and material press. Uh, so this one has only 138 instances, and this one has only 81 instances. So the imbalance between this uh, type of um, materials will cause a problem as we'll see in the future. Um, so we have been seeing this problem for many uh, classification problems, uh, 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 tasks. I mean, it's, um, it's non-trivial to solve this imbalance um, problems across uh, different classes. Um, for numerical values, you can do like um, S mode or to down, to, to down select the samples. So you end up selecting less material start um, or uh, operations I mean, so that you can balance between different uh, types. However, I mean, that also reduces number of information you can use. And uh, this, smaller number of uh, instances will cause a problem as we'll see in the future slides. So this uh, synthesis per assess extraction follows basically the same method I explained uh, before. Uh, what do we call it is sequence tagging or sequence labeling It's basically the same, which is the method to entity recognition by tagging each token in a sentence. So we must break the whole sentence into each token, and each, and each token can be a word, it can be a punctuation mark, um, it can be a symbol. And a commonly used schema is called a BIO tagging, in which B means beginning, I means inside, and O means outside. So, it, so in this in this specific problem, we have BM, which is uh, the beginning of a material, and a BO, which is beginning of operation, and a BP, which is beginning of a property. And so does I am, I O, and uh, I P. So you can see that in this example, um, the pure will be labeled as O because uh, they are not uh, um, tagged as any entity types. And the L I four T I four O twelve is tagged as B N because it's the beginning of a material, uh, and because it is the only token in the material, so there's no I M. Um, and, uh, and similar for RI2, CO3, and uh, the, the ionized water, 
is an example which has two words. So it has the, uh, the, the beginning material and inset of, of material. So even the, like, uh, see the 12 hours. So the, the, the 12 is, is the BP and, and H is IP. So it really a fine uh, granular uh, annotation. And then they use um, deep planning. So they use, um, so this is the, um, the architecture of um, their, um, their model. So first they um, use these words as input and then they do the word embedding, right? So as they just map each word into a, a dense vector and then they um, put these vectors into uh, a, bio, a, a, a bio RSTM. So I'm going to introduce bio RSTM in the next slides. Um, but it's basically a deep learning architecture which will output the hidden vectors as the uh, representation by taking the context into consideration. And then they use a conditional random field um, classifier to, to, uh, to predict the BIO tags. So conditional random field is a supervised model in which the probability of the current, work, uh, current tokens tag depends not on its own features, but also on the features and the tags of its neighbor tokens. So um, it's so the inventor of the, the CRF is um, is Dr. Uh, uh, Andrew McCallum, which is an uh, NLP expert in, in UMass. Um, so the the RSTM is a recurrent neural network in which a neural cell sends feedback to itself and the iteratively updated prediction results to match the true labels for each epoch. So this is architecture of, of RSTM. So you can see that um, this uh, cell just sent back uh, you know, the, the signal to itself. And the H is the hidden vector, which will be used as the representation of X, or X is the input word. So this is the just unfolded version of, the, of RSTM. And this is the, just to, you know, to look at the, the inside structures of each cell. So each cell is, uh, you know, has a complex of computations. And the input is X, which is the word, and the output is the H, which is the hidden vectors. And it, the, the, those hidden vectors are representation of this word. So in the bidirectional RSTM, the sequence is processed in the forward and the backward order and then produces two sets of hidden vectors for each token. The two hidden vectors that can then can concatenate it to generate the final representation of a token. So that's why you see um, uh, those here. So those are concatenated. So um, using this um, architecture, I mean, they were able to uh, you know, predict the tag for each token, and then they can glue them together to generate the, um, the entities. And now they do the synthesized relation extraction. So now we have entities, right? How do we infer their relationships? They use a bunch of uh, heuristic methods. So heuristic is just a, you know rule based. So uh, so I'm going so I'm not going to show all of them. I just uh, show two as example. Um, so maybe just one because uh, I'm running out of time. So uh, the uh, the next an operation phrase is connected to the next uh, operation phrase in the same sentence or in the next sentence. So in this, uh, in this diagram, each circle represents a token, uh, right? And this green circles represent an entity, right? Which is classified as an operation. And each uh, box represents a sentence. So you can see that these two operations, they uh, appear in the same sentence. And these two, they appear in two uh, different sentences, but they're next to each other. Right, so when I'm trying to predict the next relation, I'm just uh, you know trying trying to see okay this operation is done first and then this operation, and then this operation and then this operation. So it's fairly you know straightforward, but this is not 100% accurate. I will want to say it again. I mean, but this is their method. This is uh, their model, right? So I'm gonna skip this, um, but you know, as uh, Dr. Liu will post all the slides and videos on YouTube, so um, you can read it if you're interested. 
So now they come from the evaluation. So all the machine learning methods needs to be um, evaluated and there comes to be an evaluation metric. Um, so they use uh, like 140 files for training and 46 for development and 40, uh, another 46 for testing. So they use a precision recall on F1 and they use a macro F1, which is average F1 for all the types for evaluation. Um, so this is the evaluation table. So, on, so here on the left column is the word embedding models because they use word embedding models, right? Here to embed these words into tokens. And they want to see how different models will impact the result. And they do, they do. Okay, so they tried the character embedding and the BPE embedding and the mat to vec and mat uh, WE, mat ELMO and the sign word. So, so you can see that the mat ELMO, which is the word language model trained on material science literatures, they really does a good job. Uh, and the signboard was a language model that was trained on scientific papers, but uh, they're, they're trained in PubMed papers. So they're in mostly in biology and life science and a part of computer science domain. So they, they do a decent job, but not the best for this task. And so the best result overall, they have 83% um, of F1 uh, for the materials, they they achieved about 92% F1 operation, 89% F1, the property is 74. So this result does not look very bad, right? Um, however, if we look at the um, each um, each type of material, property and operation, they really vary a lot. And uh, so pay attention to the material intermediate and the property press. We talked about this too before. They have extreme, uh, relatively uh, low number of instances of training data. And, uh, you know, so uh, look at uh, I mean, their result. They're, they're very bad, right? So, and F1 is, uh, this one is only 0 0.1. So it, the data actually cannot be used for production. Um, and part of the reason was, um, because of the smaller um, number of training data. And the relation uh, evaluation, so you can see the coverage is basically on the recall, right? And the accuracy is, um, so you can see the accuracy looks uh, pretty good, like 80% and 90%. And the operation material is uh, relatively low, but the coverage is really uh, terrible. And this means that their method, their rule based method really misses the misses a lot of, uh, of the important uh, um, relations identified by humans. So this uh, diagram shows the sample efficiency. So sample efficiency means that's okay, I have uh, four, uh, 240 um, uh, used at the ground truth. Okay, can I use a relatively small number of, of um, samples for training? and get the, the same result? Or can you tell me if the data is enough? I mean, do I need to add more uh, data or not, right? So they studied this and found that with 20% of their data used as training, they can achieve uh, you know, uh, a relatively high F scores, uh, almost as high as their final result, which means that the sample efficiency is is really good and the current corpus is large enough to train the sequence uh, uh, tiger. Okay, so then I finished that paper. And lastly, I just want to briefly talk about another uh, AER project on uh, material science literature. So the, uh, the authors are from uh, Western Adult 2019 in UC Berkeley. So they do, uh, they call it a large scale because their parent data contains 3 million abstracts. Uh, from the master scholar corpus. And so similar to the previous one, I mean, they need to do tokenization, which they break the abstract into individual verse. And then they do the labeling. But uh, when they do labeling, they, um, they um, label them into seven types of entities, materials, uh, uh, symmetry, um, sample descriptor, materials, property, material application, synthesis method, a method and the characterization method. And then they basically do a, a text classifier, which they, you know, they just uh, 
uh, uh, train a text classifier uh, using about uh, 588 uh, relevant and 494 irrelevant. They use a linear uh, classifier uh, uh, plus the back words and achieve F1 89%, which is uh, pretty good. And then they train a, a, a new net, um, a word model to, um, to extract um, the entities, right? So they, so basically they, they follow the same way. The new network uh, model is um, still uh, based on, 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 on IRSTM and CRF. They're trying to predict uh, the labels for each token. And then finally, they just extract entities of the model. Okay, so this is their um, deep cleaning model. This is uh, the BRTM and the CRF. But different from the one that I talked about before, they uh, add something into the representation. So because uh, the, a, a lot of the chemical uh, formula, they do not carry any semantic meanings, right? Um, instead, they are, so they have a certain pattern there. So to capture the, uh, those patterns, they uh, added another layer of, of RSTM to encode the whole word into a dense vector. And then, then they concatenate this character um, RSTM output into the word embeddings for each word. And then put it in another set of RSTM to generate the representation. And then they use the conditional random fields to, to predict the tag for each token. And this is the evaluation results. They have um, accuracy um, or F1, uh, you know, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty good, about 80% or, or better. And the, the right column uh, just shows the, you know, the number of um, entities they extracted from their parent uh, data set. So it's 19 million tokens are, are uh, predicted as material. Right, so the overall accuracy is about 87%, and they extracted about 81.23 million from their parent uh, data set. So here I just want to mention that this paper only does the name entity recognition. Uh, they do not uh, extract or classify uh, relations. Okay, so one thing that this paper did, but other people did not do, is the entity normalization. Um, so, which means that, okay, we'll have one um, entity like a TiO2, right? Or titania, or AO2, A equals to Ti, and titanium dioxide. So they all refer to the same, same specific material, which is TiO2, right? So how do we unify them? How do we, um, uh, you know, Put them together. So this is especially useful for uh, for query expansion, like when the user search for a titania, right? So you know that this um, refers to some other materials. So the document that does not contain titania but they contain TL two will be returned in the search results. So they use um, external uh, databases for verification, like the PubChem uh, lookup tables and PyMagin uh, uh, library. And uh, based on that, they also train a binary classifier to entity names with multiple words. So they, they created a ground truth of 10,000 entity pairs. Um, and that, that's are labeled as um, as synonyms or not. They use word embedding as the feature and they use a random forest to classify um, them. And each entity is stored as its most frequent occurrence synonym. So they, achieved an uh, F1 to be 0 0.94, which is pretty good um, for uh, the entity uh, normalization. And of course, it's not 100%, so they need to do the manual error check um, on all the results, which is, um, you know, uh, the good thing is that, okay, they still need to do the manual correction, but, you know, because most of the results are correct. So the, um, that, uh, the annotator do not need to correct all of them. So, so it's, it, it still reduces a lot of work. 
Okay, so this slide is just the list of the codes and the data um, available for um, this project I was talking about, uh, including the, the one from UC Berkeley, the MIT and the UMass, um, and uh, Kim's paper and Kuniyoshi at all. Um, so if you're interested in, I mean, you are free to um, explore them. Um, the Kuniyoshi's link does not work, but so I don't know why. Okay, so in, in summary, um, the information extraction in material science focuses on extracting entities and synthesis procedures. Um, so deep planning based sequence tagging is uh, the state of the art for the NER task uh, using word embedding plus um, by RSTM plus CRF model compared with the general NER. So general NER means um, no, the NER model trying to identify people, organization, location, etc. So, but you know they are uh, designed for uh, for general um, a text like uh, the Wall Street Journal or the newsletters or something. So these tasks have achieved about ninety percent of F one in general. So the NER for material science achieved about eighty seven percent, which a little bit lower, but you know. Um, it's very close, but it's uh, but it's still um, you know like ten percent or from the, from one hundred percent. So it needs a improvement to reduce human verification effort. So uh, re relation extraction is really challenging. So you can see that in the paper that I was talking about, um, it was based on heuristic method, um, which uh, achieved a relatively low performance. So it needs a learning based method to improve the performance. And it, uh, those people uh, have, uh, have released the annotated uh, data sets as benchmarks for future uh, models. And, and uh, the future research directions, I would say that using transformer model. So transformer model is model in which uh, it's, 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 it's based on the recurrent neural network model. However, it, um, it does not, it actually considers all the words um, in the sentence simultaneously. And the, each word will have a different attention weight. Uh, so some words are more important than the others. Um, and they also have the pre-trained language model that we can use uh, to improve the, um, the NER. Few shot learning means that Okay, now we now the supervised linear models will require a large amount of human annotated uh, data. So how can we only use only a few? A few means like less than ten. Right? I I just gave you less than ten uh, uh, label samples. Can you get a decent prediction for me? Multitask learning is okay. So currently the entities and relations they are modeled individually. Right? I first extract. Uh, um, entities, then I classify their relations. How can we combine these two? A joint models, the entity extraction and the relation classification. And active learning. Active learning means that, okay, I, I, I have a teacher and a student, and the student has to learn from the teachers, and the teacher will dynamically feed the new information from uh, uh, to the students so the students can um, can incrementally learn from the teachers to increase the performance. Okay, so that be my presentation. Um, thank you very much. Um, now it's time for questions. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I was a little bit late. At oh, no problem. In that meeting. Uh, thanks.